So I think there will be moments when symbolic issues like water will come to the fore and we will have a resurgence of interest in, in the, these issues. From the U.S. perspective, um, the largest source of energy imports by far uh, is from Canada and Mexico. Roughly one-third of our total uh, energy imports come from our two neighbors. Proportional sharing clause is very important because it's unique to all international trade agreements that I have ever studied. It effectively makes Canada an energy colony. What the clause says is if Canada were to take measures to conserve some of our non-renewable hydrocarbons, natural gas and petroleum, if we take those measures, we still have to uh, export to the United States uh, the same proportion of our oil or gas exports that were sold over the th previous three years. What if Canada wanted to preserve 10% of our uh, uh, petroleum production for future generations and for conservation purposes? Well, when you work through the numbers and you find that we're obliged to sell the U.S. two-thirds of the petroleum we produce, the effect of, of applying the proportional sharing clause could actually mean there would be shortages to meet the needs of Canada. Canada is a great multicultural, uh, multilateral country. We need Canada's leadership and ingenuity to develop new commissions or organizations whose purpose is to graft a North American vision onto the landscape and push forward for North American policies and institutions as well. So I hope that Canada sees within itself the capacity to have a big effect and to take the lead. And if it took the lead and worked closely with Mexico, my guess is the United States would be very agreeable to that. They don't really need the money. As you can see, housing is natural, you say it's natural material. The fruits, all of these they have, they have farming, they have hunting. They have everything they need to live and more, but then they get the progress arriving to these towns, power lines, running water, and these are services that you need to pay for. You cannot pay with a bag of corn, you need to pay with cash. So they start needing the money, <coughs> getting in the capitalism system, and that's when poverty arrives to these towns. You know, they need the money, okay, I have some money, I buy a radio and a TV, I see what the, what's on TV, it's pure marketing. Things that they didn't need for over 2,000 years, in a decade they start needing. Pues bueno, el Tratado de Libre Comercio, como tú sabes, no todos estamos realmente informados como se debe. O sea, en lo único que nos afecta es en la desinformación. ¿Me explico? No todos tenemos también la capacidad de admitir el libre comercio. Y nada nos ha beneficiado el libre comercio. La verdad, estamos igual o peor ahorita con esta crisis que tenemos. Realmente es difícil. How has the experience in Mexico been um, uh, in terms of NAFTA since it started 15 years ago? Ha sido una situación positiva. Ha mejorado realmente la eh, el comercio entre los tres países. Sin embargo, lo, lo que sí te puedo decir que eh, hubo ciertos acuerdos dentro del mismo eh, nosotros le llamamos TLC o Telecam que no se cumplieron como es la situación del, del transporte que es por eso que ahorita volvieron a grabar, o sea, hay que pagar impuestos por algunos productos norteamericanos. No estamos informados al 100% de qué se trata el libre comercio. O sea, si a nosotros nos informaran como comerciantes qué vínculo nosotros tendríamos con el, con el Tratado de Libre Comercio, sabríamos realmente de qué se trata o qué lo compone al 100%. Pero como no tenemos ese tipo de información, es muy difícil que todo, en concreto, expresemos en qué nos beneficia y en qué no. Given the similarities of our two economies, of our two cultures and our countries, 
it seemed to me doable to achieve, to pursue what I, I've always referred to as, as a kind of common economic space, a single economic space, where the border becomes irrelevant. I think Mexico could become part of it, um, as indeed uh, NAFTA was modeled after the Canada-US agreement. And as the Europeans, as, as you will know from the whole history of the European community, remarkable achievements they've had, it's all been incremental over the years at different speeds. They've been doing it incrementally for years. Um, the European Union was initially started with a, an agreement in the 1950s to regulate the production of steel among all the European countries. And the argument then was that you'd hate to have a country like Germany corner the market on steel and develop an empire that would attack the rest of Europe again. So they had a reason based on recent history at the time, which said we need to, uh, we need to have a, an agreement that regulates production of steel across Europe. And from there, they built on it with subsequent agreements. The road to North American Union um, is not a, no, a new development. Uh, probably it kicked into high gear in about 1965 with the creation of the Council on the Americas and David Rockefeller was the founder of that. And there was a meeting down in Central America between it would have been then Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson and uh, Lyndon Johnson. And they discussed um, all of these things that we're, that we're seeing now. They discussed uh, the creation of one North American um, uh, market, uh, one North American currency. There's a distinction between a, a customs union and a monetary union. A customs union is a common external tariff. It's a logical extension of a free trade agreement and basically says that the tariffs that all three countries have with the outside world will be the same. Right now they're different. Uh, theoretically we have no tariffs between our countries, but on the the perimeter of our countries, we utilize different tariffs. That proves to be extremely inefficient and costly uh, for our own commerce because everything has to stop at our regular borders to see what amount of the content was made in North America and what was outside. So it's, it's a self-defeating proposition. It would be far better if we could come up with a way to eliminate what's called rules of origin, have a common external tariff, which is called a customs union. Completely different from that is a monetary union with a single currency. That is a very complicated task. The Europeans had been struggling with it for over 30 years, and they tried and failed through a variety of different techniques before they finally, in 1999, uh, implemented the euro. In 1999, when the euro was created, because of my background, I thought that the same arguments that made the euro such an attractive innovation that the people actually went with it, purely on economic terms, um, also would apply to North America. And I had this idea of writing a paper in which I outlined what would be the benefits to Mexico, Canada, and the United States for creating the equivalent of the euro. And I had the idea the inspiration to call it the Amero. I think one thing people who are dollar-based need to focus on is the Amero. That's the one thing that nobody's talking about, but I think it's going to have a big impact on, uh, on everybody's life in Canada, the U.S., and uh, Mexico. If you Google it, you'll find out all about it. Well, you could tell us a little bit more right now. You always hear it on CNBC, don't you? <laughs> the Amero is the proposed new currency for the North American community, which is being uh, developed right now between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico to make a borderless community, much like the EU, and uh, the dollar, Canadian dollar, U.S. dollar, and the Mexican peso replaced by the Amero. You, um, you really think that will get any, any leeway? Uh, you may want to visit a couple of websites and see how far along it is. The Canadians are pretty upset about it, whereas the Americans, apart from the Texans, um, are the only people who know anything about it. The, the rest of the public's really uh, sort of with their head in the sand on this one. There is a, a group of people out there who believe that there exists a conspiracy to deprive the United States and Mexico and that's where the center of these conspiracy theorists is. They are worried that uh, there was a, a conspiracy to rob the two countries of their national sovereignty 
and uh, through the back door bring in socialism and various other kinds of things. This is, of course, nonsense. It, it's a little bit like the story about Kennedy's assassination. St people still don't believe that Oswald did it. There's a whole uh, industry out there. There is a quarter of all Americans or something like this still think that Elvis Presley lives. I would put the stories that these guys are manufacturing essentially into that category. I cannot deal with it. I am not following it. I hear about it because, as far as I'm concerned, it is just uh, a conspiracy theory. The idea that I am associated with and that I'd like to push is that there are clear economic benefits from having a common currency. The basic economic argument in favor of a common currency is that you have lower transactions costs for firms that are exporting, importing, making investments, and secondly, that the cost of borrowing that is highly correlated with the cost that has to be paid by the federal government, cost of borrowing by other jurisdictions, corporations, consumers, mortgages, they all would be lowered to the benefit of Canada. In 1974, uh, as a condition of joining at the time this G7, this group of seven, which became the G8, which is now the group of 20, uh, this was following something called uh, the Morris, uh, Milton Friedman School of Business in Chicago. And they thought, well, it's better to give the banking industry of countries to the private uh, markets and let it be handled there and go with the ebb and flow. But as a condition of being a part of these groups, nations have to give up the control of issuing themselves their own credit, of, of loaning to themselves. And because we chose to do this, because we thought being part of this group of seven or group of eight, now G20, was a good thing for Canada, we stopped using our Bank of Canada to fund our infrastructure. We don't borrow from ourselves anymore. We borrow from the private banking cartel. The outcome should be clear. On a board that determines what the interest rate would be for a North American a mayoral area would have to give greater power to the country that represents 70% of the entire economic activity and financial power, the United States, and only, say, 15% for Mexico at the moment and 15% for Canada. The most important thing about this kind of a central bank is that the politicians have to stay out of it completely. Central banks should be removed from the control, the clutches of politicians should be given a constitution which says, thou shalt only be responsible for price stability. Politicians still play a role because they have to appoint the people to the boards which determine the uh, day-to-day -day policies which in the end are supposed to have the outcome of price stability. To give up this right to uh, lend to ourselves is, is absurd because what has happened? We've gone from an $18 billion deficit to a, up to a $588 billion deficit of which about 95% of that is compound interest. The money we're paying interest to who? Well, there's no person out there who has a Canadian flag, lives in Canada, who we pay $60 billion in interest, both federally, provincially, and at the municipal levels too. We're paying someone else interest on the money that we can print and, and produce ourselves and lend it to ourselves to fund our infrastructure, to fund our social programs, to fund our education for our university students who are also being put in a debt trap. But uh, as you give up control, of your currency. And William Lyon Mackenzie King said it most, uh, most poignantly when he said this. He said, you know, the issuance of the credit and currency is the state's most precious resource. And once you give up that control, it matters not who makes the laws of the land, because usury, once in control, will wreak havoc on any nation. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the Federal Reserve. As I said once before, this is uh, the very institution that is highly responsible uh, for bankrupting uh, America and essentially enslaving the world under a perpetual debt system. It's by no way federal, and there are certainly no reserves. What's your full name? 
What's that? What's your full name? Is there any reason?